uh, organized by LSC Ideas, which I will be uh, moderating this evening. I am Professor Michael Cox um, of the LSC, one of the two founding directors of Ideas, along with uh, Arnie Westad. One of our objectives in creating Ideas some years back was to provide a platform for informed debate. And one of the ways we've been able to do this, luckily, is through our Philip Roman professorship. The first person to hold this uh, prestigious position here at Ideas was Paul Kennedy. The last was Ramachandra Guha, the great Indian historian. And the current holder of the post is the author and journalist uh, Anne Applebaum. Anne was formerly a member of the Washington Post editorial board. She has also worked as the foreign and deputy editor of the Spectator magazine in London, as the political editor of the Evening Standard, and as a columnist at several British newspapers, including the Daily and Sunday Telegraph. Uh, luckily, I think for her, and luckily for us, from 1988 to 1991, she covered the collapse of communism as the Warsaw correspondent of The Economist magazine. And her first book, Between East and West, Across the Borderlands of Europe, derived from that period, described a journey through Lithuania, Ukraine and Belarus, then on the verge of independence. The book received many prizes. Her next book, Gulag, A History, was published in 2003 and won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2004. And her latest book, Iron Curtain, was published last year in 2012. She holds degrees from Yale and from a much more serious institution, the London School of Economics. <laughs> In tonight's lecture, which she will bring all her formidable forensic skills to make sense of Russia and its leader since 1999, Vladimir Putin. The title of the lecture this evening is Putinism, the Ideology. I would like you all to put your hands together. Welcome, Anne, tonight. Right. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back here for the third in this uh, series of lectures. Um, I'm impressed that so many of you came here on this freezing cold night. Um, right. Why Putin? Uh, years and years ago, it always used to annoy me when journalists and analysts became obsessed with the personality of the leader of Russia, you know, speculating about his taste in whiskey or his wife's fashion sense or lack of it and using these little elements of his biography to make judgments about him. Uh, nevertheless, in analyzing Russia today, we are once again confronted with an inescapable fact, and namely that the personality and beliefs of Vladimir Putin, the current Russian president, matter just as much as those of his predecessors, if not more. Uh, in a state where authority is still vested in individuals and not in institutions, the president of Russia's vision of his country his understanding of its history, his education and training and background, and his personal experience of life in the Soviet Union and in contemporary Russia now have an incalculable effect, impact on Russian political life. Uh, and as is, is if that were not enough of a reason, I have another reason why I want to talk about the personality of Putin to start out with, which is that I feel that I spotted him early. Uh, back when he was still prime minister during the president of Bor presidency of uh, Boris Yeltsin. And what caught my eye at the time was a visit he made soon after his appointment to that job, uh, to the Lubyanka in Moscow. And once the headquarters of the KGB and its most notorious jail, the Lubyanka is now the home of the FSB, Russia's internal security services, uh, an institution which Putin himself directed before being asked to head the government. He visited the Lubyanka in 1999, on December the 20th, a day still known and still celebrated by some in Russia as Czechist Day. Uh, it's the anniversary, and that was the 82nd, of the founding of the Cheka, which was Lenin's secret police, the institution that was later became uh, the NKVD and, the, and later the KGB. Uh, and in that place and on that day, so redolent of the bloodiest pages of Russian history, Putin solemnly unveiled a plaque in memory of Yuri Andropov, uh, nor was this an accidental gesture. Uh, later, as president, Putin ordered another plaque placed on the Moscow building where Andropov had lived, 
and he also erected a statue to him in a St. Petersburg suburb. Now, for Putin, who's a man who pays nowadays extensive lip service to the theory of democratic elections, and, and indeed the practice, uh, Andropov would seem an odd hero. Uh, Andropov was the longest serving director of the KGB, holding that office from 1967 until 1982, the year when he briefly became general secretary of the Communist Party. Um, but unlike some of his predecessors, uh, Andropov was not just some faceless apparatchik uh, or aging uh, party hack. Uh, he had a very straightforward theory of governance. Now, in Soviet terms, he was a modernizer, but not a democrat. So on the contrary, uh, having been the Russian ambassador to Budapest during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, Andropov understood very precisely the danger which Democrats and other free-thinking and self-organizing groups pose to totalitarian regimes. Uh, he also understood simultaneously that, like everyone else in the KGB, that the Soviet economy was lagging far behind that of the West. At the time of his death, he'd come to the conclusion that something had to be done about this. And, and what he, the conclusion was that order and discipline – uh, as enforced by the methods of the KGB, and that included the fight against alcoholism, laziness, and corruption, uh, coupled with the use of carefully targeted violence against dissidents and other representatives of potentially disruptive small groups, would restore the sagging fortunes of the Soviet economy. Now, Vladimir Putin not only came of age in Andropov's KGB, an organization that he first tried to join by his own account at the age of 15, but he shared some life experiences with the man who later became one of his heroes. Uh, as ambassador to Budapest, uh, Andropov had been shocked when young Hungarians first called for democracy and then protested against the communist establishment and then took up arms against the regime and, not coincidentally, lynched several secret policemen. Putin had a similar experience in Dresden in 1989 where he witnessed mass street protests and the ransacking of the headquarters of the Stasi, the East German secret police. Somebody reminded me today that it is a story told about him is that he was one of the people standing in front of the Russian compound in Dresden, the sort of Russian uh, KGB compound, where he talked a mob out of sacking that building too. Uh, whether that piece of it is true, it is certainly the case that German colleagues of his, as he recalled years later, had suddenly lost their jobs and their privileges from one day to the next, and this was very shocking. Um, now, both Putin and Andropov drew the same conclusion from these traumatic experiences. You know, talk of democracy, even when it seems on a pathetic and small and unimportant level, can lead to protests. Protests can attract uh, more followers. Uh, the more followers can lead to bigger protests, which lead to attacks on the Czechists. Uh, so better to stop all talk of democracy before it gets any further. And as a result, order and discipline are now words in Putin's vocabulary too. Um, now, this is not to say that Putin is in drop-off or that Putin wants to bring back the Soviet Union. Um, but it does mean that Putin, and more importantly, many, most of the people around him, is steeped in the culture of Andropov's KGB. This is where he was educated, just in the way that someday people will say of the, the students in this room, you're steeped in the culture of the early 21st century LSE. Um, but what does this mean in practice? You know, at the most fundamental level, he and the people around him believe deeply that the rulers of the state, of the Russian state, must exert careful control over the life of the nation. So events cannot just be allowed to happen. They must be controlled and manipulated. Um, by the same token, markets cannot be genuinely open. Uh, elections cannot be unpredictable. And the modern equivalent of the Soviet dissidents, the, the very small groups of mostly urban activists who sometimes oppose centralized Kremlin rule, must be carefully controlled through legal pressure, public propaganda, and if necessary, carefully targeted violence. So just like their Soviet predecessors, Putin and the men around him also assume that anyone not supportive of their regime is by definition suspicious. So this is an inherited paranoia and probably a foreign spy. So at a rally as long ago as 2007, Putin declared that, and this is a quote, Unfortunately, there are still those people in our country who act like jackals at foreign embassies, who count on the support of foreign friends and foreign governments, but not on the support of their own people. 
This, and I'll come back to it later, was a direct warning to Russia's few remaining human rights activists, trade union activists, uh, as they well understood. Uh, It was also a comforting signal sent to Putin's followers who continue to believe, uh, like Soviet secret policemen before them, that all important decisions are best made in Moscow uh, by a small unelected group of people who know how to resist these foreign conspiracies. Uh, His concern about foreign influence has not faded during his years in power. Uh, On the contrary, on the night of his third and most recent re-election to the presidency last year, Putin described the protesters who had thronged the streets of Moscow for a few weeks in the previous winter in very stark terms. Uh, He'd won the election, he declared with great passion, tears welling up in his eyes. and He said, we showed that our people can distinguish between the desire for renewal and a political provocation that has only one goal to destroy Russian statehood and usurp power. So Putin doesn't merely dislike his democratic opponents, in other words, or or his opponents. Uh, He believes they are sinister agents of foreign powers. He doesn't just object to the liberal political system they claim to support. He believes they're plotting to destroy Russian statehood, usurp power, and hand the country over to rapacious outsiders. Now, maybe it's just talk, but I believe that it would be a mistake to believe that this kind of talk is mere propaganda. Uh, In the past few years, as historians have had more access to Russian archives, it's become ever more clear that Soviet leaders often meant what they said, even when they were using what sounds to us like absurdly ideological language. So without any evidence to the contrary, we should assume that Putin means what he says too. Um, But although I find Putin's character and life experiences fascinating, and although I am particularly interested by the language he chooses to use, These things are really only important because they help us understand the nature of the regime which he's created and over which he now presides. So remember, this is a man who held influential positions in the 1990s, a head of the KGB, prime minister, a head of the FSB, sorry, prime minister, and who has in practice functioned as his country's leading politician for 13 years uh, since 2000. According to his interpretation of the the Constitution, he's allowed to remain in office for 11 more years until 2024. Uh, So he might well have the chance to dominate Russian politics for a full quarter of a century. Now, searching for a way to explain the system that he created, some people have used the expression managed democracy. Uh, Others refer to it as corporate capitalism. Um, Since I think it's a bit of both, and since I do think it's also closely aligned to the culture of the 1980s KGB from which Putin emerged, I am not very originally calling it Putinism the ideology. Uh, And yes, I am using the word ideology with great deliberation, uh, for although there aren't tomes and tomes of books written about it, uh, as there once were about Marxism, uh, this is a carefully worked out system with carefully designed institutions. Uh, It's deliberately taught to Russian children. It's promulgated to the voting public. It's propagated in the media. Uh, Putinism is the basis for Russian foreign policy, and it comes complete with an interpretation of the past and predictions for the future. Um, It even has an ostensible goal, which it proposes to make Russia strong and feared again, and it promises, this is for insiders, to protect the power and the wealth of Russia's ruling class. Uh, It's not immutable. Uh, On the contrary, it changes under the pressure of events, just as Marxism and Leninism once did. Uh, At the moment, it is realigning itself to cope with the fact of the new and and somewhat louder and better organized Russian opposition. Uh, But what is it? Well, clearly the most central element of Putinism, at least until now, has been the carefully managed electoral process, the managed political parties which take part in that process, and the managed results. So there's nothing remotely unique or especially Russian about falsified elections. Uh, Let's just say that such things have been known to happen in the most democratic of democracies as well. Uh, Nor is the phenomenon of a leader anointing his successor, as Putin did to Medvedev, and Medvedev to Putin, is that completely unheard of either, Uh, look no farther than Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Um, But the Russian manipulation of political outcomes has gone far deeper Um, Though even Gordon Brown eventually had to face his electorate, uh, in Russia, voters are at no stage allowed to intervene in the democratic process. You know, there are no accidental victors in Russian elections because there are no accidental candidates. Uh, Instead, the semblance of choice has been carefully preserved, uh, not just through the advanced choice of the winner, but through the advanced choice of his opponents as well. 
Uh, because they do not want Russia to appear to be a one-party state, the Kremlin ensures that there are always several candidates from several parties, some of which have been especially created to look like opponents of the status quo. So the revival of the fake opposition party, a phenomenon familiar from communist Eastern Europe, uh, is one of Putinism's great contributions, if that's the correct word, to modern political life. Now, the best and sort of oldest example of this is one of the most famous, uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky's uh, Liberal Democrats, this very confusing uh, title of his uh, name of his party, which has been known to, which at one point it made the German liberal, Democrat, liberal Democrats feel they should be allied with him until they worked out that that was the wrong, the wrong group. But this is a group which routinely won uh, parliamentary seats by sounding more nationalist and more extreme, even to the point of absurdity, uh, than the mainstream Kremlin parties. But somehow, when push came to shove, Zhirinovsky's party inside the Russian parliament, inside the Duma, always voted with the Kremlin. Uh, more recently, the Kremlin has tolerated weak and certainly unpopular opponents, such as the oligarch Mikhail Prokhorov, who was allowed to stand against Putin in recent elections, though he had no chance of success. So by contrast, the Kremlin's genuine opponents have been marginalized, beaten up at demonstrations, jailed, harassed, and insulted. Uh, the Other Russia, which was the political grouping created by Garry Kasparov, the former chess champion, uh, was once described on the state-owned website Pravda.org are you, as a, quote, motley army of deviants, criminals, wannabe politicians, fraudsters, and gangsters on the fringes of Russian society. So it's nice and clear. <laughs> uh, more recently, uh, this is following last winter's demonstration, judges have handed down jail terms to political demonstrators for plotting, quote, unquote, mass unrest. Uh, police have also raided the homes of opposition leaders and lawmakers have increased fines for illegal protests. Uh, so-called illegal, uh, recriminalized libel, and expanded legal definitions of treason in order to control their opponents. Uh, but Putin has long had ambitions beyond the mere creation of political parties. Uh, it's also aimed, uh, successfully or otherwise, to create organizations which we in the rest would, in, in our context, would refer to as civil society, or sometimes as non-governmental organizations or NGOs. So again, to repeat, because of their background and training, the men around Putin view all kinds of environmental, educational, and charitable institutions not as a normal aspect of a functioning democracy, but as evidence of secret networks probably involving Western spies. Uh, don't laugh. Uh, at the same time, the Kremlin has encouraged state-controlled youth groups, state-controlled trade unions, and even state-controlled organizations dedicated to the promotion of democracy. Um, several years ago, I was asked by an acquaintance at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow to speak at a seminar on civic education for high school teachers, uh, which was being held at something called the Institute for Democracy. So I went, and I gave a short, fairly predictable speech about Western journalism, of a kind I've given many times in Russia before to other, other kinds of groups, and immediately the audience attacked me. And the first questioner wanted to know, why does America support Chechen terrorism? Uh, another asked me how I, as a representative of the Washington Post, which I then was, which they said was widely known to be a U.S. government-controlled newspaper and a mouthpiece of the White House, how could I even come there and speak about a free press? Well, you know, the audience went on uh, parroting this very, really extreme version of this kind of neo-communist, anti-American propaganda, which actually now more frequently appears in the Russian press and then was a little bit more surprising. I was very surprised by it. And afterwards, I asked the organizer to explain to me the origins of the Institute for Democracy. <laughs> ah, yes, it was, she told me, actually an older organization, formerly known in Soviet times as the Institute for World Peace. <laughs> Though it had a new title, it was under the same direction, same guy was still running it, and it operated according to the same principles. In other words, it taught students to follow whatever government line was currently in fashion. Uh, once that was international communism, and now it's democracy. So I don't know. I would guess that the perks proffered by the Institute for Democracy, I don't know what it was, a free trip to Moscow, free meals, maybe a stipend, encouraged many of the participants who were, by their own account, mostly provincial high school teachers, and that presumably encouraged them to attend the seminar. Um, but I, I suspect they'd made an ideological decision as well. You know, they came from that part of society, which, like Putin's entourage, preferred the more orderly world of state-organized civic society 
to unconstrained individual liberty um, from the part which believes, as the Russian press frequently state, that non-government groups who promote democracy are by definition Western spies. Um, Now, this same group of people are also no doubt attracted to another equally original element of Putinism, namely the managed press. This is not the censored press, it's the managed press. So in his media policy, this Putin has, at least for the most part, deviated from the methods of Andropov and, and, and the, his Soviet colleagues, who simply locked up all critics, censored everything, and made sure that everything that appeared in public was according to the party line. Nowadays, the system is different. Uh, theoretically, the f- press is free up to a point. You can, for example, publish a small independent newspaper as long as it remains very small. Uh, You can function as an independent journalist so long as you don't publish anything that truly endangers the status quo. Uh, Nevertheless, there are limits. Um, For just as the press knows it has a certain sphere of freedom, it also knows that if its circulation goes too high or its reporters' questions become too uncomfortable, then official attitudes will change. Um, Some years ago, when traveling in the Volgograd region, I met an attractive young woman journalist who worked at a local television station who was, which was owned by the regional government, as most local television stations in Russia are. So she, we talked about press freedom and all the exciting opportunities open to young journalists, and she, I think, wanted to go to the West and study, and I was very impressed. And then I asked her what would happen if she, on her local television station, broadcast something critical of the local governor. And she looked at me as if I was an idiot. She said, they would shut us down. You know, what do you think? So. Um, sometimes controls are less subtle. Uh, Novaya Gazeta, this is the one Moscow newspaper which still criticizes it, most, uh, mostly it's anti-corruption, um, but also criticizes Putin and the Kremlin directly and indirectly, has had its journalists beaten up, its offices broken into, and its accounts audited again and again. Uh, Anna Politkovskaya, which is, who is Novaya Gazeta's most famous and most talented reporter, was murdered several years ago uh, in the middle of the day in the stairwell of her own apartment building. Um, by in under very suspicious circumstances. So with tactics like that, there's no need to shut that many newspapers down. Um, And in fact, the Politkovskaya case illustrates rather well how Putinism has worked. So it doesn't eliminate all real political opponents. It only eliminates those who become too famous or too popular. Uh, It doesn't use mass violence, but to repeat, it uses targeted violence on the grounds that if the arrest or murder of a single person uh, is, 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 is well known enough, then that might be enough to scare hundreds of others. Uh, Politkovskaya was allowed to function for many years, actually, and, and wrote some very brilliant books uh, and articles, but she was killed when her investigations uh, brought her too close to the truth about Putin and the, some of the complexities of the Chechen war. Uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the oil magnate, um, who had been allowed to get rich in the 1990s, uh, was arrested by Putin when his money made him too independent. Uh, the women of, women of Pussy Riot uh, were allowed to stage protests. This is a more recent story. But when they began to attract real notoriety, they were sent to labor camps. So thus, at least until recently, Putin has been able to exercise greater control over the remaining oligarchs, the remaining journalists, and the remaining protesters. You know, without Stalin-style mass arrests, would-be regime opponents can be intimidated into silence and cooperation because no one wants to share the fate of Politkovskaya, Hodorkovsky, uh, or the women in prison in Siberia. Um, now, the Putin ideology does not operate in a vacuum. Uh, as Marx said, and he said many wise things, uh, base determines superstructure. Uh, the, the, the economy has a, impacts the, the society. And there's no doubt about the fact that Russia's carefully managed democracy is fueled, funded, and supported by a carefully managed economy. Uh, It is, and it has been since 1991, a mistake to call this system capitalist, although it possesses some apparently capitalist institutions like stock markets and banks, Um, because, in fact, the resemblance is superficial. Um, In truth, Russia is not a capitalist society. It's a rent-seeking oil economy, one which resembles Saudi Arabia far more than the United States or Western Europe. Uh, But even as an oil economy, Russia is an original one with distinctly Putinist elements, as in Saudi Arabia, the nation's largest companies and banks, Gazprom, Luke Oil, Rosneft, are owned by a small group of people. Uh, yet these owners are not an official ruling family like the House of Saud. Uh, 
Uh, instead, they are a subset of Putin's inner circle. So some of them hold double jobs as government officials and captains of industry. Uh, other magnates share their wealth with the politicians in order to stay on top. Uh, economics is politics and vice versa, although not always in a transparent manner. Oligarchs can and do fall out of favor. The richest men in Russia are not the same as they were 10 years ago, but it isn't always clear how or why. So since taking power, Putin has taken this system, which was first created in the, under Yeltsin, and he's turned it in his favor. So although he sometimes speaks of economic reform, He's actually not interested in creating a legal system which would encourage entrepreneurship on a broad scale or a banking system that would help small and medium-sized enterprises grow. Instead, he's presided over an enormous transfer of assets from the state and from other oligarchs to his friends and probably himself. Um, So the trial of Boris Berezovsky versus Roman Abramovich, which was staged in London last year, some of you may have read about it in the papers, was in essence the public airing of the bitter dispute between a Yeltsin-era oligarch who lost much of his fortune to a Putin-era oligarch. Um, Yet if Putin and his friends uh, have made themselves extremely rich, and if they control print and television media, and if they control the police and the army, then why does the Russian president bother with the fiction of democracy? You know, given their wealth and power and apparent security, Why should Putin, Medvedev, and the ex-KGB men around them need all of these elaborate games and facades? You know, why does Putin hold elections at all? Why didn't he just appoint himself president? You know, why maintain all of this pretense? The, The answer to this, as I hinted earlier, is what I think is the key to understanding the nature of this regime. So remember, Putin's goal is to maintain dominance of his clique, Uh, And for some time now, this ex-KGB inner circle have believed that the greatest threat to their power and control and their money uh, is not the West as such, but Western democracy rhetoric. So Putin and Medvedev do not, and they cannot possibly seriously fear Western military attack, you know, that NATO and the Belgians and the Portuguese will get together and invade. Um, Putin made that they do fear popular discontent, They fear the public questioning of their personal wealth. Uh, They fear the open criticism of the basic tenets of Putinism and, of course, political demonstrations of the sort that created the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and those which happened on a a smaller scale after the parliamentary elections in the winter of 2011. to, To stave these things off, they believe they have to work hard to maintain their legitimacy, both at home and abroad. So during his, for example, during his 2008 uh, election campaign, it's true, Medvedev did not travel around the country and he did not meet with supporters. Uh, Nevertheless, a campaign atmosphere was created. People were encouraged to vote. The media covered the election story and all the trappings of democracy were present, even though we all knew who would win. Uh, The same thing happened in 2012. Uh, Putin refused to take part in debates on the grounds that to do so would impede his, impede his ability to, do, to duly carry out his duties, in the words of his spokesman. Uh, yet the campaign, once again, was a matter of public discussion debate. Um, for all of his professional wariness of the real thing, Putin continues to adhere in word, if not in spirit, to the language and to the appearances of democracy. And indeed, these appearances matter to him enormously. Um, the appearance of democratic politics, democratic discourse, and capitalist economics. And this, it's really this which gives his regime its novel and deceptively powerful ideological edge. Um, the need for legitimacy has also inspired some of Putin's harsher rhetoric about the West and especially about the United States. So more than once, he's accused the United States of encouraging the spread of weapons of mass destruction and encouraging terrorism. Uh, We all forget these kinds of comments because they often get thrown away, but he has openly compared America to Nazi Germany. Uh, He recently set up an institution designed to monitor democracy in the United States, and he frequently accuses both Americans and Western Europeans, especially the British, of hypocrisy of various kinds and human rights violations. Now, this rhetoric serves several purposes, but above all, it is designed to inoculate the Russian public against the example of more open societies. Underlining this rhetoric is the Putinist interpretation of history. Famously, we all know this, the ex-Russian president once described the breakup of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, He's also displayed Soviet flags in anniversary parades, and he's brought a neutral version of the history of Stalinism to Russian textbooks. 
Um, more importantly, Putin has spent much of the past decade trying to promulgate an alternate post-Soviet history. So in his version of events, 1989 and 1990 was not a moment of liberation, but it was the beginning of economic collapse. And the hardships and deprivations which Russians genuinely experienced during the 1990s were not the result of decades of communist neglect and of widespread theft, but of Western-style capitalism, democracy, and Western economic advice. You know, communism was stable and safe, and post-communism was a disaster. You know, the Soviet Union was great, at least within some parameters, and Russia was, until Putin's arrival, a failure. The Soviet Empire, launched in 1945, was a moment of triumph to be remembered proudly, and the blood and terror required to achieve it, achieve it are forgotten. And the more people believe all this, the less likely they are, and this, I, this is what I assume is the, is the case, the less likely they will be uh, to want a system which is more genuinely democratic and genuinely capitalist. So the more nostalgia there is for Soviet-era symbols, especially imperial symbols from the year 1945, the more secure the KGB, KGB clique is going to be. Uh, this context makes Putin's harsher verbal attacks on some of Russia's neighbors easier to understand, too. Um, in the past, his most vitriolic rhetoric has been reserved for those countries which most successfully navigated the path from communism to open societies and which maintain the most open and most pro-Western political systems, Poland, Estonia, until recently Georgia, and until recently Ukraine. Um, so it's highly improbable, for example, that Putin ever feared, uh, the, actually feared this, the missile defense shield which President Bush wanted to place in Poland, and it's impossible to believe that he was truly intimidated by NATO's somewhat pathetic relationship with Georgia. But he is afraid of the example set by these countries since they challenge his own country's geopolitical choices and they, they offer an alternate narrative and American support for them has infuriated him. Uh, Russia's foreign policy towards the post-Arab Spring Middle East is also dictated in part, I believe, uh, by concerns for legitimacy at home. You know, Russia's behavior in Syria is in this sense highly ideological. You know, again, although Russian diplomats are openly contemptuous of Assad and although Russian economic interests, when you look at what they really are, are in fact very narrow. Uh, it's, it's clear that the Russian government in the wake of the successful Libyan revolution does not want to see another authoritarian state toppled by a popular revolution. It's just too close to home. Uh, nor does he want to see another victory, quote unquote victory, for the Western democracies or for what might be broadly understood as a Western political movement, although how Western they are, who knows. But, but that he, he fears that it undermines his own authority and his place in the world. Now, Russia is not alone in fearing the democratic example of the West and in preferring, therefore, to see authoritarian regimes around the world succeed. Um, and although there have been a lot of arguments about whether Russia does or does not have so-called so soft power, uh, it's true that Putinism as a model does have a great deal of appeal um, in many places. Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, uh, but also in Iran, in Venezuela, and elsewhere. You know, the Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, took a leaf out of Putin's book a few years ago when he held an academic conference in Tehran to discuss the Holocaust. And he invited a number of famous Holocaust deniers. So he declared this an opportunity for thinkers who cannot express their views freely in Europe about the Holocaust. You know, so if the West is going to shelter Iranian dissidents, in other words, then Iran will shelter David Irving and David Duke, just as Russia will sponsor institutions which investigate democracy in the United States, and Russia, of course, will uh, give passports to um, uh, roaming French actors who don't like the tax regime at home. <coughs> now, P P Putinist politics, politicians and businessmen have also tried, and again with some success, to gain influence abroad through the spread of Putinist-style corruption. Um, often they've done so with the help of Russian oil and gas companies you know, uh, and through commercial transactions. You know, again, at the moment, Russia's, the company Luke Oil controls refineries in Ukraine, Bulgaria, and Romania. It has assets in Greece and ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, Gazprom now owns the Serbian National Oil Company, which, according to things said at the time, uh, was openly purchased with an eye to the influence it would bring as well as a third of the Portuguese gas company, now Galpenergia. It has very close ties with the Austrian energy giant, OMV, and a strong relationship with Ruhrgas in Germany. 
So if all of these were purely economic relationships, I wouldn't bother to mention them. But in every single country where they've invested, the Russian oil and gas oligarchs have not only lobbied, have also lobbied for financial and banking regulations which will be favorable to their interests, um, and they have used their money to influence foreign politicians as well. So famously, even a German chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, was induced to go and work for Gazprom immediately upon leaving office. So thus does Putinism try to preserve itself at home, at home, promote itself abroad, and protect the wealth and power of its leaders. And yet, of course, the ultimate test of an ideology is not whether it can work for a brief period of time, but can it last? Um, if I had given this lecture five years ago, uh, I might well have argued that, yes, absolutely it can last. Uh, with energy prices still rising and the media monopoly firmly in place, there really seemed no reason to doubt it. The events of the last 18 months, though, mean that I have to be more cautious about the durability of Putinism, as does everybody in the wake of the Arab Spring have to be cautious about predicting anything. But, but it's true that in recent years, the building blocks of Putinism have begun to look weaker. So clearly the growth of the Internet has helped to undermine Putin's media monopoly. Um, partly as a result, the managed elections, once accepted by Russians without apparent comment, have sparked a series of open protests. It's harder to fool this generation of Russians, or at least harder to get them to roll their eyes, you know, support the traditional fatalism, and ignore the obviously falsified elections. Um, at the same time, Putin's his own political party and his own civil society organizations, Nashi and other groups, um, have more recently attracted opprobrium rather than new members because they're associated with official corruption. Um, as a result of these changes, a new Russian opposition has emerged. Um, unlike its predecessors, its rhetoric and energy are focused not on ideas about human rights, but on corruption, on theft, government theft, and on the lack of transparency in the government and the economy, precisely the things which Putinism depends upon to survive. Uh, meanwhile, the implicit promise of Putinism, we will offer you stability uh, and, and a slowly rising standard of living if you allow us to rule, has been eroded by much slower growth in parts of the country. And a major drop in oil prices would accelerate this process because it would deprive the Russian state budget of most of its revenues. So if the dramatic fall in gas prices in the United States heralds a real change in Europe, then some of Russia's ability to influence the political views of its neighbors might change as well. Um, certainly the uptick in violence, uh, the harsher legal methods, and the extremely harsh language Putin has used in recent months against the new and still very small political opposition, indicate that he too is worried. You know, managed democracy, the whole point of it was to keep these kinds of movements weak and fragmented. So is there anything we can do to help this new opposition to encourage change in Russia? Um, speaking frankly, uh, not much. Uh, our ability in the West to alter the course of internal events in Russia is limited, and it always has been. Um, still, the fact that we have very little influence on the future of Putinism doesn't mean that we have to go along with its central tenet. You know, we don't have to pretend, as the Russian political elite does, that Russia is a democracy or that Russia is a normal member of the Western international community. You know, we don't have to accept its description of its NGOs as foreign agents. We don't even have to continue to allow Russia to remain a member of the G8, which is historically a club for rich democracies. Originally, Russia was allowed to attend its meetings on the muddled theory that this would help Russia become a democracy, but it didn't. So why not end the pretense? And the point here is that our standards should remain our standards and our language should remain uncorrupted. But even if we can't do much, uh, the Russians can do a great deal, and I hope we don't make the mistake of underestimating them. Um, one of the things I've learned living on and off in Eastern Europe over the last 20 years is that no country is incapable of change. You know, sooner or later, the generation trained in the mindset of Andropov's KGB will retire. Uh, sooner or later, young Russians will draw their life lessons not from the experiences of the 1990s, but from the experiences of the 2000s. You know, there's no guarantee this new generation will be you know, better or more liberal or more democratic, but it will definitely be different. Uh, perhaps in this context, we should all remember the words of an ancient Slavic proverb taught to me by my mother-in-law. Where there's death, there is hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>
When Anne, when Anne was talking about Russian influence abroad as a lifelong supporter of Arsenal, immediately I thought of Chelsea and wondered, should I view the team in blue more differently today than I've ever done in the past? There you go. Chelsea is soft power. Discuss. Um, I want to start off with one question, uh, which goes back to the beginning of your, your wonderful lecture there, Anne. Um, who, you said he created this system. Um, we don't want to go necessarily into deep origins, but much of what you described seemed to me sound like Stalinism in a modern variety. That maybe many of the things that he also inherited from the Yeltsin period. It does seem to me that often we get this kind of comparison between the Yeltsin years and the Putin years. And it does seem to me that many of the practices which were very illiberal and very undemocratic and the use of money to buy elections, remember Berezovsky and Khodorkovsky and the others bought the election for Yeltsin in 96. So I wonder, in terms of the origins, has he inherited more than he's actually himself created? I think absolutely he inherited a previous system. And it's also true that many of the elements of what became Putinism were put in place in the 1990s. Um, the you know, the, 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 it was possible to control the media and to take charge of the media because it had been divvied up between various Yeltsin-era oligarchs who were then, some were, were made to conform or made to leave the country or made to hand over their, hand over their work. The, the, the revival of the old KGB, now the FSB, also began in the Yeltsin era too. It was, there was a sort of, uh, there was a moment of, there was a kind of wobble in the early 90s when it looked like the KGB might not last, but really by 1995, 96, it's been reinvigorated, it has new powers. I think it was given power to, to begin to control the internet very early, 96, 97, I don't remember the date, mm. but it's absolutely, this begins earlier on, and Putin is really the effect of these changes mm. rather than the cause of them, and yeah. I, I certainly didn't intend to no. make him sound no. like it was all in his, yeah. you know, Putinism came out of his, his, sure. his brain. Yes. Um, one, you know, you, you can understand when you, when you, um, when you name an ism after a person, it, like Stalinism, yeah. it, inv it inv invariably yeah. sounds that way. But it's, yeah. it's really a shortcut yeah. because I can't think of a better name for it. No, 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 great. And it was also Yeltsin who facilitated Putin's ascension to the prime ministership in 1999. Yeah, the Yel yeah. Yel I mean, we were discussing this earlier. Yeltsin and people around Yeltsin mm -hmm. brought Putin into the government. And it, it's all under still fairly murky circumstances, exactly mm -hmm. how and why that happened. Yeah. But it was certainly them. They, they, they were the ones who promoted him. Yeah, great. Okay. A uh, number of hands have already gone up. So I'll take two at a time. A gentleman over here, and I'll take Adam Roberts from the front there a second. Please, yeah. Thanks a lot um, very much, Professor Applebaum. Um, <clears throat> you talked about the way that uh, um, Putin um, manages the press rather than censors it. Um, and I was just wondering if you could uh, just explore that um, difference uh, a, a little bit more um, comprehensively. Thank you. Okay, fine. Uh, could you bring the thing over here quickly, please? Yeah. Oh, you got one. Adam, please. Um, Adam Roberts. Uh, could you say a bit more about belief? Uh, you suggested that the lesson of the Soviet archives is that uh, good communists believed what they were saying. But we know that they didn't always. And there was a decline in belief, an observable decline mm. in belief in the communist system over decades. Uh, and you also suggested that perhaps, uh, as it were, the, the present rulers of Russia really believe in this ideology. But if, and it's, it's perhaps a big if, but if they can see some of the patent absurdities of it, the extremism of the accusations, just as many in the Soviet Union saw the absurdity of calling all opponents in Czechoslovakia as it were, Western lackeys and the like, um, one could see a rot set in. And if Putin gets associated, not with success, but with failures, perhaps over Syria, perhaps over another case, might the, the level of belief be vulnerable to change? Thanks. I'll take those two. Yep. And? two. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Adam Roberts. Uh, yes, indeed, um, belief rises and falls and declines. And, and Putinism is, by comparison to the massive edifice that was Soviet Marxism, it's a pretty thin thing. Um, it's, it does have a theory of history, and it's you know, been put in the textbooks, and there is rhetoric around it. Um, but it's, it, it, you know, 
it suffers from some of the same things that you know, Stalinism was always an attempt at totalitarianism. It never succeeded in being totalitarian. You know, the idea was that it would, uh, you know, everybody would eventually believe all the same thing, but it never quite worked out in, in that way. And Putinism, in that sense, is also it's an attempt to create ma- a kind of stable, managed democracy. Um, and I was trying to describe that attempt. Whether it will succeed is doubtful. I mean, in fact, the the um, the, the 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 nature of the new opposition, which is uh, which is very which has interestingly evolved with Putinism, um, is quite different from the old opposition. So in 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 in, in the uh, ten years ago, there was a kind of opposition to the parties of power in the Kremlin that used human rights rhetoric and spoke of democracy, and harked back to an old, an earlier era of. Um, of dissent, and the new opposition doesn't do that at all. It speaks very clearly about corruption. It's organized around websites that examine and report corruption, and it's aimed, in, in a way, it's, it's more symbiotic with Putinism. It attempts to undermine um, Putin's claim to have created this stable and useful system. So absolutely, it can be undermined. Um, the person who I think believes what he says, at least some of the time, um, is Putin himself. I mean, the uh, the... The, the, the rhetoric about Western NGOs and Western groups and, you know, environmental organizations and so on, he's, he's repeated several times, you know, over the years unprovoked. I mean, it, it, it comes out of him when, you know, when he, when he wants to talk about these kinds of organizations. And I see no reason to think that's fake. I mean, I, I don't have any... You know, in, in the way that when, you know, Stalin said he wanted to uh, conquer Europe, you know, do we have any reason to think that was a lie? I mean, no, he did, he, he made a stab at it. Um, so it's, you know, again, you, you're going to have the question with Putinism that you often have with Bolshevism, to what extent do people believe what they say and to what extent do they say things because it, it, it makes you fit in better. But, but absolutely it's undermineable and it's, it can be, you know, in a way more easily than, than Marxism, which was a much more complete system. Just to so add, it, add to Adam's point, I mean, do you think there's a, a social, a sociological aspect to this thing? Put it rather crudely, it's the middle class who don't like it, but essentially maybe a lot of working class people who have got more stability, maybe better salaries since 1998, since the financial. They may think, well, it's not so well, bad. Well, it clearly has been, the, it has been the case that people have been saying it's not so bad. I mean, right. opinion polls in Russia have for, for a decade been saying, you know, people are asked questions, you know, do you like y- your local government? No. You know, do you like the way the justice system works? No. You know, do you like the way your factory works? No. Do you like Putin? Yes. yes. I mean, there, exactly. there have been, yeah. there have been, Poll after poll has, has, has looked like that, and he, has, he did become, a, you know, successfully. I mean, it was a, it was, he successfully became a symbol of stability, um, you know, as a, and, he, and the, the rhetoric about the 90s, that the 90s were all chaos and catastrophe and that I have now created something better, I think was indeed popular. I don't mean to imply at all that he's not popular. Sure. I mean, the, the high school teachers yep. at the Institute for Democracy clearly very keen on it. Um, the, the managed press is a complicated thing. I mean, the managed press, in some ways, works. It, it works more like um, some of the East European press. Like, I mean, I happen to know that it works quite a lot the way the East German press used to work. So there's no censor. You know, when you write an article, you don't send it off to a censor who stamps it and sends it back to you, um, which is for, which is how it worked. Um, and some, you know, newspapers don't have in-house government censors who run them, and newspapers and television stations aren't government state-owned institutions, you know, where people are hired and fired by the state. It doesn't work like that. It's more a kind of, if you can think of a sort of a very extreme form of political correctness, you know, that everybody knows what are the parameters of what can be said and what can't be. And people are always pushing at those parameters. So they, you know, there, there are no absolute rules about it. Um, so they, you know, you, you, you're allowed to say, you're, you're allowed to criticize certain people but not others, or you can, pushing things too far in one direction gets you in trouble. So it's okay to, um, you know, it's okay to talk about certain kinds of local corruption, but it's not okay to talk about Putin's personal wealth. You know, and any articles about his family or his money um, or his girlfriend uh, get get you in enormous amount of trouble and can get your, you fired and your newspaper shut down. And so people are aware of these parameters, and sometimes they push at them, and sometimes they don't bother. Sorry? What do you mean by more subtle? 
No, 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 there's nobody. No, it's self-censorship rather than censorship. So, no, there is nobody stamping it and saying. So, yes, it's more subtle. Um, yes, it's, it's ill-defined. Um, it, it changes over time. You know, what, what, what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say is, evolves all the time. There aren't absolute rules about it. Um, and there are newspapers and there are local magazines and there are local radio stations which push the envelope all the time and try and say more than they've been allowed to say in the past. Um, and, but it, it can be extremely dangerous. Um, so, so th- th- you know, that's the system. The, the one piece of it they have not successfully controlled, um, su- surprisingly because others in other countries have managed to control, is the Internet. And until recently that didn't matter so much because uh, not that many people had access to the Internet. And I think, I, I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head the numbers, but it's still relatively low and relatively small. And you often find that even when people do have access, they have, the, the connections are so weak that, you know, uh, they can't download videos and so on. So there's a limit to what people can see. But the Internet, they, they've, they've not successfully controlled it, and that has been the vehicle by which the, the anti-corruption movement, such as it is, has, has, has operated. You know, there are websites which collect stories about corruption and name particular officials and try and nail some of these. Um, and Putin has recently taken up that theme himself. I mean, he now talks about corruption and he now talks about prosecuting corrupt bureaucrats. Um, so he's clearly been influenced by that. Um, it's, not a, it's not at all a black and white system. It's really not Stalinism. Yeah. It's not a drop off. It's not, it's not the Soviet Union. There are, um, there is, um, uh, it's, it's a give and take between how much, how much pressure journalists are willing to put on him and, and how much he's willing to okay. respond. I, I, got and I keep up. saying he, but of course it's a large group of people. I've got, I got one journalist that's already got his hand up there, Gideon Rackman, and then I'll go to David Manning. Gideon. Hi. Um, I wanted to, to, to go back to this question of belief. I mean, you said that you, you're inclined to believe that uh, Putin really does... Uh, give credence to this idea of foreign conspiracies and so on. Mm. And yet when you talked about missile defense, you said he can't possibly believe this stuff. Uh, are, are you sure about that? Because, I mean, as, as you mentioned, if one looks no, maybe back... Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe he believed... I mean, I meant he couldn't possibly believe in it because, in my view, it was never, ever going to happen. And any mm. rational person analyzing, you know, the, 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 the arguments and debates about missile defense in the West couldn't, couldn't see it as some kind of threat to Russia. But, no, actually, you're right. He, maybe he could believe it. Okay. And maybe, and then, he, maybe he was made paranoid by it. Right. And, and a broader sort of follow-up question. I just wondered how much respect you have for him, not as a, as a human being, but as, as a leader. I mean, do you look at Putinism and Putin himself and think, well, this is quite a formidable system, quite a competent person, or do you think he's actually thrashing around, he doesn't, you know, it's, he doesn't really know what he's doing? Before you answer that one, let's bring in uh, David. David Manning. David? And mine's a rather different question. It's to ask you to say what you think about early Putin. Putin, when he had just taken over in the first presidency. This is proof that it really is an ideology. There's early Putinism, late Putinism. Do you think that at that stage, I mean, George W. Bush is famously mocked for having said, I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul. But there were quite a lot of Western leaders at that stage who had the impression that Putin was trying to explore what power might be like, what, what were the options for Russia, the enthusiasm for WTO membership, possible NATO membership, all these things. Do you think that this was simply because he was new in the job, oil was only $10 a barrel, he was one casting around wondering what to do? Uh, or do you think that this was always a sham and that the Andropov and then the Yeltsin context made it inevitable that he would always have behaved like this. And I suppose as a subset, did the, was there anything the West, Western countries did at that stage which would have produced a different Putin ideology? Yes, we always go back to this thing of what could we do, which... <laughs> um, gosh, is he competent? Um, yes, he's competent. Um, up to a point. I mean, this, the, the system that I was descri- I made a stab at describing in the speech has been put together, and this is sort of an answer to your question, too. It's come together in pieces over time. I mean, he did not enter, you know, public consciousness in 1998 with a clear idea and a vision of exactly how he was going to construct this and so on. I mean, it's a little bit, um, bits of it have been put together and, and added and, 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 and molded with time. Um, 
he's, he has competently constructed, um, you know, for the last, certainly for the last decade, he has competently remained in power. He has competently, you know, he has uh, enriched the people around him, and he has created um, something which has seemed very stable. And so uh, in that sense, yes, it's a successful system. You know, but coming back to Adam Roberts's question, um, has he created something that, you know, people believe in and feel enthusiastic about and want to fight for and die for and um, will never question? You know, that I doubt. Um, the, 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 the kind of fatal flaw all the time, it seems to be, is the corruption because it's something that touches people not just at the highest level but also much further down. And the, the sense of lawlessness, you know, people know that if their car gets in an accident with a police car, you know, or with an official car, that they're the one, you know, and it was the official car's fault, they're the ones who are going to get in trouble and there'll be no recourse. And the sense of lawlessness ups, upsets and bothers people and undermines um, that sense of stability and this kind of relief that pe- people's salaries are paying on time, which was so important in the very beginning. Um, so, you know, is it well thought out and can it run forever? I don't know. I mean, there, and there, there are also, um, you know, there are pieces missing, such as, one of the problems with running a very corrupt, um, rent-seeking, uh, managing resources that way is that you might not be investing in them in the way that you ought to be. You might not be building the new pipelines. You might not be um, investing in the oil fields. You know, the, the, this, the other element that this system depends on in the long term, you know, for any kind of stability is high oil prices and high gas prices and also on the... Um, the, 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 the continued success of Russian natural resource extraction. You know, is he managing that well? Is he ensuring that the people who run these companies um, are competent? That I doubt. I mean, if, if, if people's primary goal is extracting money for themselves, then it's um, – then I don't know whether uh, – how long it will stay. They'll – you know, that will, that will work. Um, early Putinism, I mean, he – He's actually a um, – I don't want to make a caricature of him because I think he's somebody who thinks of himself as blending, you know, the best of the West and the Russian East. And he has at times appointed people who, who sound like they're going to be reformers. And in the very beginning, um, he did carry out some very important reforms, you know, the flat tax um, – uh, change, you know, making property rights work better in Russia now than they used to. And in some ways, Russia is, you know, as a, as a functioning economy, and it functions better than many of those around it. It, it and probably functions better than the Ukrainian economy. Um, and that's, that's, you know, they're, they're, you know I, don't think it's, I don't think it's because he doesn't understand how these things work. Um, and I think he initially had hoped to achieve some kind of fusion of the, the best of the Russian and the, and the best of the um, best of the West, whatever that would mean. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a mishmash idea. Um, you know, what was the point at which he stopped doing that? Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, because I, I don't have access to his inner circle. I would, I would guess it's to do with um, the, 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 the personal interests of people around him. I mean, he's, he's a symbol, but he's really the head of a group, you know, of a kind of e- economic and political cabal. And they all have enormous interests, and they have a lot of money at stake. Um, and the, you know, the, the strict application of rule of law to everybody would not be good for them. And he's, he's as, influenced, as influenced by them as they are by him. Um, and so it simply, at a certain point, I think, became not in his interest to, to continue his path. The, the harshening of the rhetoric, um, I think, is, I really think, is part of this anxiety about legitimacy, you know, by what right am I allowed to maintain it and stay in power? And, well, one of the rights I'm allowed to say, you know, if the West is trying to undermine us and sending these grouplets to undermine me and trying to fight us in Syria and Libya, you know, then I, you know, then I can defend Russia against this kind of, um, this kind of talk. And I think that's, that's – he perceives and people around him perceive that to be good for his, his status in a, in a way using – using foreign policy and using anti-Western rhetoric for his own purposes. Is there anything, to follow up on David's question, is there anything the West could have done or might have done differently to have changed or altered the course? I mean, NATO enlargement, I suppose, Georgia, Ukraine, maybe, or whatever you were thinking of, David. I personally don't think so, but I want to hear I actually, I, I don't think so. I mean, 
The mistakes that we've made, as we in, in American Britain have made about Russia in the past, have, have very often been, you know, for, for example, I think it was a mistake throughout the 1990s for Clinton to walk around with his arm around Yeltsin and say, we brought democracy to Russia, when that was patently not the case. I mean, the mistakes we've tended to make have been in not calling things by their real names and in, 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 in allowing... Um, uh, you know the Russian description, the Russian descriptions of them of themselves, um, to, to 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 pass. I mean, in the case of Putin, and and particularly in the last several years, I think that the biggest mistake we've made is to not um, not question the and, and not investigate the impact that Russian money is having on our own institutions, and whether that's offshore banking in Cyprus, Cyprus now an EU member, um, or whether it's City of London or whether it's, um, uh, you know, Dr- Gerhard Schroeder and, and the relationship with the German gas industry to Gazprom. I, I think the, the degree to which we've allowed, you know, b- um, that system to corrupt ours, which has in turn supported that system, I think it's, it's more on that level rather than the high level of politics and Tony Blair and, and George Bush, where... Um, we've been very accommodating of this new Russian system, which was, has been quite comfortable for a lot of people in the West, and particularly in, in, in this city. Mm, yeah. Okay, I've got two questions. Uh, gentleman up the back there, yeah, please. Yeah, you, yeah John, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. John Berryman. Yeah, John. Yeah, John Berryman. Uh, I get the impression you don't like Putin. Um, oh, I've never met me. him. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm going to give you now a little bit of neo-communist anti-American propaganda, which you obviously... Uh, we needed uh, some. Thank right. you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's why I chose you, you know. Um, difficult to pick out, you know, where I would sort of... Uh, I mean, uh, since I disagree with almost all your interpretations, it's difficult to find where I could start. What I would like to suggest is the following. Putinism, what is it? I don't see it in quite the terms you do. I see it as an attempt to establish a strong sovereign, sovereign state... Uh, which doesn't seem to accord with the uh, prevailing ideology in some other parts of the world, and that's what irritates those other parts of the world. Uh, I put that with the fact that you rather dismissively suggested at one point that he regarded the breakup of the Soviet Union as a catastrophe. Uh, You you are aware, of course, that uh, the Nevada Center and many other uh, polling organizations, which the West are very happy to use all the time, indicate that that is a view which is shared by a significant, probably getting on to three-quarters of the population of the Russian Federation. Much lower. So what I want to suggest is that Putin's worries and concerns, which you expressed at the beginning, at the the time of his election, about what he saw to be American intervention, interference in the uh, internal affairs of Russia, might it not be connected with the fact that the Soviet Union broke up only 20 years ago, that the uh, breakup was not entirely unconnected with some brilliant uh, self-liquidation by leaders that were wildly applauded in the West, like Yeltsin and Gorbachev, and that really what sticks in the throat of, dare I suggest, Applebaumism, Oh, is, is, is the existence of an independent leader, an independent state in the uh, Security Council and elsewhere, which refuses to conform to what the West perceives to be its, its like axiomatically uh, uh, correct ideology. I know the United States is an indispensable nation. Every administration tells us this. But you know, there is a possibility of plurality in the world, and it seems to me Putin embodies the, no, the possibility that there could be some other perspective than the one that you've so eloquently expressed. Thank you. Very nicely put, John. <laughs> right, and, uh, and for something else, yeah, please, in Brown. Nicholas, Thanks, John. good evening. I'm from the Department of Law. You've got to speak LSE. a bit more clearly, please. I can't oh, sorry. Hear. Um, yeah, it's directly linked to the question that the gentleman just had. Um, I would suggest that uh, to fully qualify as an ideology, probably the P- Putin's world, worldview should also encompass also a uh, uh, a firm vision of Russia's place in the world. Perhaps you could um, elaborate on that a little bit because you suggested that it's more or less uh, his, his aim, political aim outside of uh, Russia is more or less to protect the self-serving system that he has put in place here and I would probably ha- how you feel about it, uh, d- does it go beyond the, this point? Okay. Okay, so, so yes, indeed, Putinism and Putin's Russia does represent an alternative to Western liberal democracy. Um, it, 
it is a um, it is it is uh, neither liberal nor democratic. Uh, it is a um, it's a kleptocratic state which regularly uses violence against its citizens and which. Um, in which there's the, uh, the judicial system doesn't work and there's no rule of law. Um, uh, it, it is, it is, it's an alternative, and, um, you know, there, there can be many alternatives, but um, uh, I don't really quite know how to answer your question. All right. but, I, mean, you I know, think it was a statement rather than a question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it, it, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Um, I would be careful about opinion polls in Russia. Um, <laughs> I recently read a very brilliant book um, by a writer called Leon Aaron, uh, who has written a book about perestroika in which he went back and looked at what people were saying, actually saying and writing, um, and at what, what opinion polls said in the late 1980s about the collapse of the Soviet Union, and people were wildly in favor of it. Um, and they were the, the, the support for democracy and for Western style capitalism was uh, very high. Um, the uh, why there would be less support for that now is clearly the effect of the last 20 years, including the last 10 years of Putin's um, ideology and, and, and rhetoric and power. Um, and I would be careful about what that means. That's all I would say. Mm. Um, the question is, does Putin have a um, – uh, does he have a view of Russia's view in the world? Absolutely. Um, he, it, it's, it's complicated by the fact that Russia does not have the military power that it once had. Um, but he would, he, would he would very much like it to be a kind of deciding voice in the world. A, um, you know, and again, this is part of uh, backing up his own legitimacy – uh, he would like Russia to have a um, to be to be a you know decisive inside the United Nations um, to be a leading voice in Europe, um, and he can you know he continues to see Russia as the obvious rival to the United States, um, even though he the United States does not see Russia as an obvious rival itself anymore. And in fact, Russia figures very low in American priorities right now, I mean, rightly or wrongly, and whether that's good or bad. It's, you know, problem number 17 on the list that starts with Iraq, Iran, you know, North Korea, and so on. Um, but he continues to raise, um, within Russia, he speaks as if the United States is still his main rival. Mm. Um, and he, he, he continues to want to play a role in Western and in European politics, um, much more so than in Asian or in, you know, although there's you know somebody said well you know one week he's the, you know there's the Shanghai Forum and now there's a tr free trade zone and you know customs union inside the former Soviet Union sometimes he plays with relationships with the East but he keeps returning to this role of a kind of arbiter of Western policy of a you know a balancing a figure who balances within Western Europe and who is some kind of opposite number to the United States. You know, whether that's um, – whether it's deliberate, whether that's his, you know, Soviet habit, um, whether it's because that's popular in Russia, you know, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure. But that is clearly what he wants and how he sees Russia's role. Do you think – just to add to that, do you think he sees any value or importance in the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China? They have now held their third, fourth uh, meeting in India last year. I mean, the Russians – do talk the, very the, the Russians are very, very keen on very being keen on the in BRICS, the BRICS, absolutely balancer, keen yeah. on being in the BRICS because yeah. um, of the BRICS, they are by far the least successful economically. Mm -hmm. And so being mm -hmm. in the group – no, this is you – know, <laughs> You mean no, no, Russia, no, Russia is, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, being yeah. inside the group sure. of the BRICS is, is, is good for them. I mean, you have these very fast-growing economies, mm -hmm. um, Brazil, China, and India. And Russia has, you know, it's been said several, many times that Russia doesn't quite fit in that group in the mm. same way because mm. it's, a, it's essentially an oil economy rather than an entrepreneurial economy. Mm. But it's very good for Russia's image, you know, to be part of that group. Mm. And so, yes, they're keen on it. Yeah. I just want to redress the gender balances. Two, two women over here. Yeah, one and two. Yeah, doesn't matter which way you want. Thanks. And then in, in red. Um, when you were discussing um, the establishment of managed civil society, you referred to the uh, establishment of state trade unions. I wondered if there was any space in Russia 
for a free trade union movement to develop. I'm, of course, thinking of the example of what happened in Poland and in its role in the downfall of the Eastern European yeah. Soviet Empire. Okay. So, Solidarność question, and then putting it along, please. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I just wondered if we know, and you know anything particular about Putin's view of uh, China, not particularly as a Chinese economy, but of the Chinese um, Communist Party and its relationship with them. Mm. Okay. Two questions, Anne. Um, the, the free trade union point is interesting. I was actually in, of all places, Arkhangelsk about eight years ago now, and I met a woman who was trying to organize trade unions there, and she was very keen on me because she thought with my connections to Poland that I could help her meet some of the founders of Solidarity and so on. I think I tried to arrange a, a, a meeting and so on. Um, this has been one of the things that, though, that uh, the Russian, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that the, the, the Putinist clique has been very keen on suppressing for exactly the reasons why you can think of. And, you know, one of the first Western groups to be kicked out of Russia was the AFL-CIO. Um, because it was doing exactly that. It was advising people how to organize a trade union, you know, what are the techniques. I mean, it was fairly neutral um, ILO kind of UN material, but it was, a, but it was, um, it was bothersome um, uh, to Putin and to the people around him because of exactly the reason why you would think. So, yes, there has been an effort to prevent free trade unions from forming. Um, China is interesting. Somebody said to me today um, in, the, in a seminar, you know, the problem with Russia being close to China is it's like the rat being close to the boa constrictor. I mean, this, this, the size of the, of the economies are now so different, and the dynamism which China has, which Russia does not have, um, I think makes the Russians very wary of the Chinese. Um, the, you know, the fact that some several million probably Chinese now live on the Russian side of the border in Siberia um, is something that people know about but don't talk about much. I mean, and the, 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 I've, if you've ever I've seen photographs of that border, you know, on the Chinese side, there are these huge buildings now and enormous brand new, um, brand new city. And on the Russian side, you know, wooden huts. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, it, but, but there's not much there. And so there's, there's an enormous amount of, um, uh, there, there's kind of rivalry and tension in, built right into that relationship. Um, in, in, and the fact that it doesn't come out more in public is interesting, and I'm not quite sure um, what it means, except that the Russians like to avoid it. What he thinks about the Chinese Communist Party, I have no idea. I mean, they um, – I don't know of any public statements he's made about it. I mean, they certainly maintain cordial relationship. Well, the, um, the official position of the Chinese Communist Party is exactly the same as Putin's. The, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a strategic and ideological disaster. That, well, is, that, that is the that, official position of the Chinese government. That I know is true. My friend Professor Westad took me around the party bookshop and, in Beijing and translated all the documents for and me. The, yeah. and, the, and the Chinese paid <laughs> a lot of attention to Gorbachev and a lot of attention huge. to what, went, what they think went wrong. The lessons of history. The, and they've, they follow the lessons of history very well. But, okay. but what, how it works the other way around, yeah. I, I know I less know about. That. Okay. We've got a few more questions over here. This could be the last set of questions. Hello. Too. Can you uh, hear? Oh. Gentlemen there first, and then move it forward. Yeah. Robert Chancellor, St. Anthony's. Um, Thank you, Professor Applebaum, for your carefully constructed uh, portrait of Putin. Um, bearing in mind that the British Council remains closed in Russia, and also there's no progress with Litvinenko, and also the American Magnitsky Bill, in contrast to the need for energy security, how do you see the uh, future for the policy of engagement? Hmm. Okay. And then move it forward. Could you just draw across? Yes, yeah, sir, please. Um, do, do you agree with uh, Neil Ferguson that Russia shouldn't really be included in the BRICS because of its overdependence on energy, its aging population, and that really after the early to mid 2020s it will be in decline economically? Okay, and then there's a chat behind you. But just take the three, please. Yeah, well, maybe another. Yeah. Bruce, um, I'd like right to now. ask a question about Medvedev. Um, was he anything other than a puppet of Putin? Okay, and there's, there's another chap just behind you. Just pass it back. We'll take four. I thought you said three. Oh, I know. <laughs> you can handle it. Yeah, um, one last one. Could you elaborate a little bit more about um, on the relationship between the Russian Orthodox Church and um, Putin? Um, or differently asked, um, what role right. does it play? 
in ensuring the power of attraction. Right. Okay. So we've got one on engagement, one on the BRICS, one on Medvedev, and one on the church. You answer all those, and then we'll say goodnight. How much time? Oh, I don't know. As much as you like. Right. Well, uh, you know, I don't have Neil Ferguson's strong views about the BRICS, I, I don't think. And <laughs> not I, I'm not, he, I think. But anyway. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I'm invested in the existence of this institution, um, but but I mean I think I will just repeat what I said earlier, which is that that yes, Russia increasingly looks odd in that company because it's a it's a one trick pony and because it's such an it's an energy dependent economy in the way that those three aren't, um, whatever else they may be or may not be, and however successful or not they might or might not be. Um, so 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 yes, it's always they look increasingly odd in that group and. If it continues to remain energy dependent and if the shale gas revolution goes the way we think it might, um, then, yes, you will see a, a, a rapid economic decline. Um, uh, but who knows? Uh, engagement. I, I don't think we have a, a – there is another policy except for engagement. I mean, there's – you know, Russia's not a um, – it's not a hostile regime. I mean, they don't have um, – uh, they, 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 you know, they, in the sense of, you know, there's no immediate threat of Russian war with the West. Um, we have a trade relationship with Russia. We have strategic relationship with Russia in all kinds of odd places you don't think of in Central Asia to, to do with Afghanistan. Um, we have, you know, there are useful things we can do with the Russians. Um, I don't, I don't at all advocate cutting off relationship or ending diplomacy with – I mean, that, that would be counterproductive, and I don't, I don't see a use for it. I mean, I think the, the um, slow engagement, um, the, 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 the non-naive and, you know, without illusions attempt to engage Russia where it's possible to engage and do things with Russia where they can be done, I think is the only policy there is. So I don't have a um, – I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see what the alternative is. Um, Medvedev is an incredibly interesting figure who, and I, you know, I don't know to this day exactly what, what his role was. or what. I mean, he clearly was a puppet in the sense that Putin and the people around him placed him in power, and they uh, ensured his election, and then they, when they decided you know, to end his presidency, then they ended it. So in that sense, he's their creature. Um, he did try, while in power, to sound different, and he met with all kinds of people in Russia, ranging from the Novaya Gazeta journalists to the, um, uh, you know, um, uh, range of activists and journalists and business people, and he sounded more. He used language um, that that made it sound as if he were more interested in, in a more genuine democratic or liberal reform. Um, what that meant is now hard to say. Um, he was clearly surprised by the Putin's announcement that uh, he would become the president again. Um, and, you know, there's always been speculation there was some kind of deal done between them and Putin, you know, P Putin then changed the terms of the deal. But, I, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, he clearly, Medvedev clearly speaks for a part of the Russian elite. I mean, there is... Um, part of the business class, part of the middle class, part of the intelligentsia, um, likes Medvedev and wanted, you know, he, you know, he may have thought he was becoming the leader of that group. He may have been trying to do that. Um, he may, uh, what, 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 what seems clear, though, is that he doesn't have a real power base. I mean, he was not able to make sure that he was reelected um, because... He, he clearly doesn't have the power, the influence to do that. But he does speak for somebody inside the, the, the elite clique, and therefore um, he's, he's an interesting figure, and we'll see what, um, what happens to him. Russian Orthodox Church, very long story. Um, a, a piece of Putin's uh, search for legitimacy and for a kind of um, a, a historical story that will support his right to remain in power is his relationship with the church. Um, somebody, I, I, I taught a seminar today, actually, and we were discussing the, the there, there are some oddities about this. You know that, you know, does is, 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 does Putin want to revive a kind of red version of history or a white version of history? You know, the white version of history, let's revive the Orthodox Church and, 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 and bring back the role of, um, of, of, of the church into public life. You know, but you know, if we're going to also be reviving elements of the Soviet Union and Stalinism, that's a bit odd because the the Soviet Union killed all those people and destroyed them. So which is it? You know, 
Um, and he's, he has put together a kind of patchwork where he's picked elements from the past that he, um, you know, that he wants to bring back into public life and, and, and repress others. I mean, even, for example, in his revival of the Soviet Union and of Soviet history, he's been quite choosy. So a lot of emphasis on 1945, on imperial conquest, on the victory in the war, mm. not much talk about the 1930s, about even about industrialization, collectivization, that whole piece of the Soviet story, he's, he doesn't bring that up. He doesn't speak of it. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church, again, as a way to um, you know, establish his credentials to be leader of Russia, clearly having a relationship with this very in- ancient institution is part of it, and he's, 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 he's played with it. Um, does it contradict some of the other things he says? Yes, but um, life is sometimes contradictory. Okay, and uh, on, the, on that Hegelian note, um, <laughs> we, shall, uh, we shall conclude. Uh, I just want to make uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, ideas being the highly efficient organization that it is, already has Anne's lecture in print form. Uh, being a highly peculiar organization, we're giving it away free. Uh, I think we should be charging for it, but there's, uh, clearly I've been overridden in the Politburo. Uh, but it will be outside. We have about 150 copies for those who would like to pick a copy up and that in a sense, gives you more detail from this particular lecture. In case you forgot what I said. Yeah, I didn't want to tell you beforehand because you're all (laughs) rushed away. Secondly, just to announce that Anne will be lecturing here on the 12th of March with the wonderfully enigmatic title, Does Eastern Europe Still Exist? And I think it's a fantastic title, and I'm sure it's going to be a great lecture. Finally, just thanks to Anne for a wonderful lecture this evening. Thank you to all your (laughs) questions.